Hello, and welcome to the Turchin Center for the Visual Arts Virtual Art Talk Series. I'm Christy Chanowski, Director of Arts Education and Outreach at the Turchin Center. We're located on the campus of Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. I'd like to acknowledge that the land we work on is land traditionally owned by the Cherokee people. I say this as a way to remember the story of our community and to stand alongside our Cherokee neighbors. We at the Turchin Center are committed to providing engaging and educational content to accompany our dynamic art exhibitions. While current health restrictions have changed a lot about how we present our work, it has not changed our mission to engage learners in and through art. We hope you find our virtual content inspiring. Thank you for taking the time to engage with our work and with other art supporters who, like you, are inspired and uplifted by the visual arts. This evening's event features insights from artists Suzanne Sparge and Holly Roberts on their exhibition, Fictive Strategies, on view in the main gallery of the Turchin Center, and will be moderated by Assistant Director for Arts Education and Outreach, Shauna Caldwell. Shauna will begin the evening with a tour of the main gallery giving us an overview of our feature artist bios. Suzanne Sparge was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1965. She has lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico since 1989. She received her BA degree in art history and studio arts from Bernard College in New York City and her MA degree in art education from the University of New Mexico. She has also studied studio arts at La Col de Beaux Arts in Toulouse, France, Syracuse University in Florence, Italy, the Art Students League in New York City, University of Connecticut, University of Massachusetts, as well as Anderson Ranch in Colorado, Penland School of Crafts right here in North Carolina, and Vermont Studio Center. Her work has been exhibited in over 75 group exhibitions and 15 solo shows since the late 1980s. It is in the collections of over 100 local, national, and international collectors and has been represented at galleries across the United States. In addition to her own work, she is a gallery director, curator, graphic designer, and arts consultant. She is the founder, executive director of 516 Arts in Albuquerque, an independent, non-collecting contemporary art museum in downtown Albuquerque. In her arts administration work, she focuses on contemporary art and interdisciplinary projects in an educational context. Holly Roberts' first national exposure came in 1989 with the publication of the monograph Holly Roberts from the Untitled series published by the Friends of Photography. Although her work has always been based on the photograph, it was the inclusion of paint that made it so distinct. As David Featherstone says in his introduction, Roberts is a painter, yet it is the photograph underlying the paint even when it can scarcely be seen, that gives the work its intriguing, mysterious power. Drawing from the iconography of primitive art, particularly that of the Native American, Mexican, and Hispanic cultures of the Southwest where she lives, she creates paintings that address a broad range of human emotions. While it is Robert's evolving interaction with the photograph that takes her to her finished work, it is the existence of the underlying photographic image, even when it is obscured by paint, that gives the work its powerful qualities and sets up the emotional challenge for the viewer. Roberts obtained her MFA from Arizona State University and has also studied at the University of New Mexico and Bellas Artes de México in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Her work has been exhibited in over 90 individual exhibitions and over 100 group exhibitions across the United States and internationally. Her work is in the collections of many public and corporate collections across the United States. A dedicated teacher, as well as a prolific artist, she has had a profound effect on a community of artists around the country. She continues to live and work in the Southwest. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. It's always so strange to talk on Zoom. Right now, I can't see you all, but uh, I know you're there and there's a lot of friends and family members here as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, I first want to thank Marianne Redding, who 
was uh, the one who organized this show when she was working at the Turchin Center for the Visual Arts, and she's now at the Sioux City Arts Center. But um, she planned this like, oh, like three years ago. So thank you, Marianne, for organizing this. And, um, and also thank you, Holly. Holly Roberts, um, I'm really honored to show with Holly. She's a very dear old friend, but she's also been my mentor and uh, teacher as an artist. And uh, so I'm very honored to get to be uh, in this show together with Holly and um, get to talk with her today. Um, so um, I basically have two artistic lives. One is as an artist and one is as an arts professional. That's like my day job as a museum director. And my life as an arts administrator and curator and presenter of other people's art is very external and outward, um, really public, social, vocal. And basically I'm shouting from the rooftops to draw attention to art in general and issues that I care about, like the environment and climate change and social justice and immigrant rights. So a huge amount of that work is about fundraising and having to justify the value of that work. And in contrast, my life as an artist is very quiet and internal, mostly solitary, and it's not at all logical. So my art practice is about kind of liberating my consciousness from the constraints of my daily life and getting lost in my imagination. So it gives me the space when I'm in my studio for my mind to stop making sense. Um, so the imagery I'm most drawn to, and I guess we could start with the first slide. I, I'm most drawn to working with images from the natural world. Um, animals and plants are a big part of my vocabulary. And in my artwork, I can fly, <clears throat> excuse me, I can fly and inhabit different animals and plants, which give my mind a sense of freedom. So this first image is just that I've always loved getting lost in my imagination, even since I was little. And it's always given me the feeling that anything's possible. And I go into a trance when I'm doing artwork. It's kind of a state of open con concentration and uh, a focused, focused attention, but not trying not to think logically and basically I just go into the zone and I and I've been doing that for a very long time getting into the zone. Next slide. So making art really gives gives me that sense of freedom and of course you know freedom and flying I, I want to fly. <laughs> I work with birds in a lot of my work over and over because of their ability to fly and um, and that that feels transcendent to me. So I, that's as far as I prepared. Now I'm just going to show you some images and talk about work kind of um, spontaneously. So next slide. Um, this, this piece, Violet, speaks to that idea of being merged with plants and animals. And, um, and this is using uh, vintage imagery and images that I've pirated from art history and from books and um, things that I've defaced and cut up to turn into something new. Next slide. This is the image I included here because you used it to advertise the talk, but it's, a, it's about that contrast between um, noise and quiet and all these dichotomies that I explore in my work. But this, to me, this looks like a very loud image and, and parrots are loud and talkative and it's about silence at the same time. Next slide. Uh, this piece, Couchbird, is, um, uh, I think it's from about 2007. And many of the images I work with uh, come back over and over again because I use copies of things that become like a language for me. And um, this particular bird and these tree roots are things that I, I, that are kind of part of my language at this point. Uh, next slide. 
Wild Turkey uh, is a piece that always makes me think of my father, Arnold Sparge, because he loved wild turkey and he had a wild turkey belt buckle. Uh, but this is actually working with um, images of uh, Audubon images of birds and really subverting them into something completely new. You know, the Audubon images of birds were actually of dead birds. They were drawings and um, paintings done of birds that were no longer alive. So I feel like I'm giving those birds a, a new life. And, um, and part of each of these images is this place of mystery where you, you can't tell exactly what's, what's going on, but there is a story there. Uh, next slide. This piece, Icebergs, is also used from, uh, developed out of uh, Audubon imagery. It's, it's actually a cut up swan, which sounds really terrible that I cut up a swan, but um, it's, it came about because I was using parts of this swan in other imagery. And these, this, these two icebergs were actually leftover pieces of swan that ended up on my table in the studio. And um, many times that's how these odd stories materialized by juxtapositions and accidental um, connections between things that I don't plan. So I'm always looking for ways to access imagery that's not of the logical mind. I don't sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna make two icebergs made out of a swan today. <laughs> I um, really try to open up my mind and be receptive to the unconscious and see where it takes me. Next slide. This is part of a, a series. I'll have a couple of them here to show you that um, for some reason they cracked me up. They each are named after foods. This one's um, mushrooms and um, the next one, next slide is um, potatoes and um, they um, they mix these vintage images of of babies uh, with these kind of fairy tale like creatures, and um, I find them very funny. And a lot of times in the studio, the things I'm I, I settle on make me laugh, but they're also things that I find unsettling and leave me wondering. So that's always part of my goal is to be left wondering myself, as well as hoping that audiences will, or viewers will have a response that is open-ended like that, that you can't really quite figure out what it means, but it's taking you somewhere and you're trying to figure out a story. Next slide. Um, tornado, uh, I'm actually going through a few slides now that focus on a lot of different animals. I know a lot of, a lot of people know my work as having birds specifically, but I, I explore um, merging with all kinds of animals. So this one is the deer and um, next slide. And ostrich is one of those. Um, Part of the uh, process of working with animals and plants is um, finding a connectedness in the world. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's something when I, when I can become merged with animals and plants in these kind of intricate ways through collage, it, um, it makes me feel connected and connected to a kind of larger consciousness of um, the natural world. Next slide. This is kangaroo. This is another that makes me laugh. I don't know if these make people laugh or I, I found a lot of people find that maybe they're creepy and I'm always on that edge too. I, I want them to be a little creepy, but not too creepy. So um, kangaroo, um, is um, something I, I, I see myself and people I know in these characters, although they're completely unrecognizable, but there's always, there's always a story happening. Um, next slide. 
this uh, owl piece is actually Virginia Woolf's face and um, a room of one's own was a really uh, pivotal uh, piece of literature for me and um, Virginia Woolf just seems totally suited in my mind to to being an owl in this piece. She seems like she's really found her place in the world as an owl. So I'm just sharing with you thoughts from my imagination. Um, they're not uh, analytical or conceptual in any way. They're really about threads of connection in the unconscious. Next slide. Radiate is a piece using a vintage portrait of a woman that a dear friend of mine and, and kind of art sister and muse Valerie Royball gave me this. She collected a lot of, uh, uh, his, she was an antique collector and had all kinds of vintage imagery. So she shared a lot of those images she collected with me and uh, she passed away a couple of years ago, but she's still very much part of my work and my process. I um, feel very connected to her while I'm working in particular, but she, this was a 16 by 20 portrait um, that was all beat up of a woman. It may have been a, actually a death portrait, but it's another case where it's brought back to life um, and it's, it's part of the natural world and it's all about the imagination emanating uh, next one. And this seated cat is uh, uh, one of my old favorites. It was shown up at Turner Carroll Gallery a few years ago. And um, the face is actually a combination of, um, um, here I go, forgetting a name. Um, it'll come back to me, an actress. Um, it'll come back later in this evening. But um, anyway, the, uh, the incongruous combination of characters, whether I know them or not, with animals um, always um, opens up my, my creative juices. And uh, I try to find faces that aren't specific people necessarily. Um, I, I like to uh, work with faces that I feel kind of could be universal in some way. So I, I, I grab them from all kinds of sources. I mean, old magazines and antique stores and thrift stores. And um, I basically, I, I like to find these sort of anonymous characters that can be every man or every woman or every cat. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> this piece cat was actually a commission where I was given um, just one moment. Oh, Shirley McLean, I see in the chat. Yes, thank you, Roger. You remembered Shirley McLean. That last image was Shirley McLean's face. Um, so this cat was actually developed from this commission where I was given a collection of vintage photographs and asked to choose whatever one I like to um, do a collage on and they would buy it. So this is one that I selected and uh, it was actually, I believe an image of a Hawaiian woman and um, next slide. Moving on from cats back to birds and accordions. So I, um, this one is called thrush. That's a kind of bird I believe that bird head is. But I have a lot of accordions in my work because I play the accordion not very well at all. And I'm, I haven't done it in a long time. But the accordion definitely speaks to me of this place where um, it's a, a creative place I go to. and. Uh, uh, I think of a, a friend of mine, Kike Congrains, he's a collage artist in Lima, Peru, and he has a whole town that um, he is the mayor of in his uh, artistic practice. So anyway, if I were the mayor of my collage town, um, there would be a lot of accordion music playing. Uh, next slide. 
And this beekeeper, this, this beekeeper piece um, also was actually inspired by Valerie Roybal, who was a beekeeper among other things. And it's one where I feel that the environment loosened up. I often have these very simple compositions on the horizon, but I'm always striving to find different configurations. Um, and oftentimes when pe other people give me materials, I get more creative with those materials. They push me further than my own materials. Um, next slide. This one, uh, Boxcar, is from a couple of years ago. It's fairly recent, and it speaks to that sense of traveling through this imaginary place that I go into when I'm making art. And um, this is definitely a journey, um, you know, climbing through drawers and upstairs and into a box that's flying away. And um, next slide. And Poisonous Mushrooms is in the show at the Turchin Center. Um, and this, uh, this piece also speaks to getting up above things and getting away from toxicity. Um, next slide. And then I think there's just, there's three of these in a row, Renewal 1, 2, and 3. And they are each very small collages on like three by five inch postcards of war-torn Europe um, after World War II. And they um, each speak to the idea of life coming back. And this idea of renewal and revival and how life always comes back and the, these cycles of destruction and renewal. So next slide. Um, they, they hold this sort of promise of um, new life for me. And that's kind of that feeling of renewal that I get from making art. It, it just, it, it, gives me energy and excitement about being alive. And uh, next slide. And this is the third one in that series. There's also a lot of eggs in my work over many years. And these also speak to that feeling of renewal and creative possibility. I never had children and I'm that was my choice, but I always felt like my creativity was sort of my baby that I was nurturing. <laughs> and um, these eggs always uh, make me think about these creative possibilities as that haven't hatched yet. And that makes me excited about the future. Next slide. And I'll, last few slides are just a few that are in the studio now. There's no titles on them because they haven't been titled yet. They may or may not be finished, but I figured I'd just share with you a few of the latest things since I, that I've been making since COVID started and since I've been in my new studio. Um, and next slide. Um, I would love to find names for these. If anyone thinks of a name, I sometimes other people title my pieces for me. Um, but uh, next slide. I think this is the last one. And um, yeah, it's about wondering and not making sense. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and what a treat to get to see some of your new work. Um, Thanks. Holly, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, I guess we're on. Um, I don't see a picture of myself, but should that happen? I see you, Shauna. There we go. Okay. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank the Church and Center for having us and Marianne Redding for the wonderful idea of putting Suzanne and I together. As Suzanne mentioned, um, we've long, long friendship going way back. And I feel like my main job in her life now is when she says to me, Holly, are these too weird? I say, no, no, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> weird is not a problem. 
<laughs> so anyway, thank you. Thank you, Church, and thank you, Marianne. And I'm just so pleased that we have this beautiful space to show our work in. Um, I thought I would go way back um, to when I first started out. I, what I did was I took black and white silver prints and then took oil paint and painted over them. Um, this is from 1987. Um, and it's, it's, I would take my black and white photographs, print them out, and then just go back in with oil paint. And of course, this is always my photographs that are about my life, my friends, people I know, things that matter to me. And as I begin to progress with my art, next slide, I began to do things, uh, pieces that were more and more personal and um, began to kind of explore. I, I think explore is a, a strange world, but a word. But um, for instance, I had I have two daughters, and being a mom is really hard. And and a lot of that was when your your child cries and you don't know what to do. And and meanwhile, the artist in you grabs your camera and takes pictures of your child crying, and then takes a photograph and turns it into something else. Um, so this is my daughter Ramy crying, and this is a uh, the, the photo that was painted over it, it's called Red House. And it's about that, having children, the conflict of it, uh, just everything that goes on. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I began to take the photographs, paint over them with oil paint, I also uh, kept sort of expanding and trying different things. So what I began to do was take the photographs, cut them up, and then reapply them onto panel so that I was building images that were photographically not what they originally were, they became other things. And then coming back in with the oil paint and uh, painting over that. And as I work, these figures like Suzanne, um, people that are animals, animals that are people began to emerge. Um, lots and lots, all my photographs from this time were of friends, family, um, people that I knew about. This is my husband underneath and the bird is a crow, which I just love, it's called uh, man with bird's head, next image. I also began to really do try and do things with my photography. I had an aunt and she had taken a, a snapshot and it was just absolutely wonderful. Part of it was in focus, part of it was out of focus. And I began to realize that I was gonna try and take photographs that were more than what I thought they were. So I began to do a lot of blurry photographs or photographs that were um, not in focus. This was um, two of my students standing um, that I cut out, glued down, and then came back in and painted over. It's called Couple with Rose. Next slide. We're in the 90s now. Um, and uh, what, what happened, what, no, actually this is not the night, we're out of the 90s into the 2000s. And now this was um, 2005. And what happened was in 2004 was that I just couldn't do the oil paint anymore. And I kind of messed around for a year and I just was kind of lost in a way. And I began to experiment with acrylic. And if you ever took one of my classes, for me to say to use acrylic would be just like, oh my God, that's like blasphemy. But sure enough, I was using acrylic paint. And what that allowed me to do was put the ground down first, the painting, and then take the photograph and put it on top. So it became more of a collage. So this is one of the first ones I did, it's called Cowboy Waving, again, my poor husband, Bob. Um, but I also would come back in with oil paint. And so I painted in the hat and the boots, um, but it is over acrylic. Uh, next slide. Uh, the events that happened in our life were always, not knowing what I was gonna paint when I started out, they would still emerge. So. My husband's mother had an aneurysm. She had to be flown into the hospital in Albuquerque from Taos. It was very serious. She had to have brain surgery. And my husband was kind of the, the pin that held everybody together. He, he, he's a doctor, so he consulted. He took care of getting her there. He took care of her when he helped take care of her in the hospital. Meanwhile, his siblings were very good about praying and, and uh, using their prayers to help her but I always felt that it was really Bob um, who, was, who was pulling the boat. So this is called being saved. So it's a very roundabout way to get back at this event that happened that was so key in our lives. Next image. 
Uh, this is now a little bit later. I think this is around 2007 or so. So I really, once I figured out that I could do these images, not, not using the photograph for what it was, but for what it wasn't, just taking bits and pieces of other things and, and collaging them together and putting them on top. So um, I was uh, really um, involved with picking a lot of photographs of graffiti. Um, I loved these signs. They had all these different meanings. And at the same time, I felt like I was really stuck in my life as an artist. I was having a lot of trouble getting stuff happening. So I felt that this image really portrayed um, what was going on in my life. It's called Road Closed. And you can see the snakes and the, down in the bottom, the, the wheels are made from barbed wire balls from a fence that was being torn down um, on one of my drives. It's wonderful graffiti, um, these, these angels in the back. Um, of course, the stop sign, one way did end, but road closed. And um, so it just really captured what was going on in my life at that time. Next image. I've always done portraits and uh, there's just something quite wonderful about making a portrait that, that you don't know who it is or what it is, but it's right. Um, this is called Gray Man. It's a small one. Um, those are my arms. But again, you can see just this combination of different materials uh, to form the, the portrait. Next slide. These two of these are at the Turchin. And what they are is they are big, big portraits, big heads. Um, the first one is called, with uh, the one on the left, it's called Man Listening. Uh, the middle one is Man with Worries. And the third one is, is Man Thinking. And, and what it was, which was just so fun, was taking the negative space and shaping it to form the image instead of the other way around. So it was kind of, kind of like, wow, what have I done? And then they were big, and, and I was trying to figure out what little bits of photographs I could use to, to make them come out. And the man thinking on the far right, those are actually the guy, the man's eyes are burls from um, aspen trees. Um, so they all kind of, what would work, what would take it where it needed to go. And, and then to see them together, I think it's just really wonderful because it's these three heads being active in the world, thinking, worrying, and, and listening. Uh, next image. Uh, this, this one, it's really about, I think, being feminine, being a woman, uh, this sort of being part of the earth. Uh, and, and this is also at the Turchin. Um, and the, the, you can see that the breasts are trees, but they're also to me suggestive of, of milk, breast milk leaking out. And then the, the shapes up ahead, I um, mean, up above have the same kind of um, act that, with the trees going on. So it's about it's about this being part of life, being being a mother, being having birthed and nourished and 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 done that, and then in the bigger sense of what a mother is. Next slide. This one is at the Turchin too. I thought I would include it. Um, it's it's called Woman uh, Flying. And when I first did it, I didn't know if she was jumping in a bad way or jumping in a good way. But then I realized she was jumping in a good way she was gonna take off and fly. And you can see the little ladder down on the right, climbing up this odd tree, the little house below. Um, another thing that I do a lot of is besides painting the, the ground, I will also paint different pieces of paper. These are dictionary pages that have been painted. And then I cut those up and use them um, to, to inform the collage. So sometimes it's photography and sometimes it's not, sometimes it's other stuff. Next slide. Uh, recently, uh, this is now March, um, COVID hit. I think we all kind of shut down, went underground, couldn't go anywhere. I stopped making art at all. It just seemed crazy. Um, th this show uh, we knew would be, um, it, it was going to be tricky to, to have anybody come to it. Had another couple of shows that were running, but no one came. So it just seemed not good. And at the same time, I had a, a, a friend who had a horse who needed to be ridden. And I had always ridden as a child. And so this was this opportunity to be outside. And so I started riding again. And it was this wonderful thing, getting me back into this world I hadn't been part of for a while. And um, the, the, the next thing that happened was, is that I, as I took the image, and what I do is I make something called paint peels, 
which are when you lay down acrylic paint on a, a slick surface, you can then peel them back up. And so I made the horse with paint peels. I mean, I had the horse head, paint peels, the angel's body. And then I used oil paint as a ground, which is what Suzanne does, um, where she puts down her collage and then comes back with this oil paint. So I was going kind of back to where I'd been before and now I was doing it again. But this is really about this horse event. This is called blessing and feeling that I just had this amazing thing happen to kind of bring me back into the COVID or the non-COVID world. I don't know, COVID, non-COVID. Next slide. Uh, I had a young friend who, uh, she's just my daughter's age, uh, uh, known her since before she was born. Um, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And if you're young and you're diagnosed with breast cancer, it's pretty, it's not good, it's pretty grim. So, so I immediately did this little painting. It's, um, it's about, it's about um, having a guardian. So it's called Guardian Angel. And it was really for her to protect her, to help get her through this terrible time. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have tons and tons of uh, cotton tails and they are not the sharpest tacks in the box, I have to say. They're always running in front of my dogs and getting hit by cars, and but they're very available to photograph. So that's another thing that happened with this COVID thing was I found that I had all these photographs of rabbits um, and I began to do the same thing where I lay down the collage and, um, and surrounded it with oil paint and then pulled out what worked. So that's a rabbit the neighbor, you know, a rabbit that lived in our yard, my legs and my dance goes, and then the paint peel bodies. So just combining all these things with oil paint. Next slide. <laughs> Part of aging is your body stops working real well. So this, this image is really about getting tighter and, and less flexible and less flexible. So this, is, this would be a kind of a self-portrait of me doing yoga. It's called stretching. And that's about what it looks like in real life. Um, again, oil paint, paint peels, bits and pieces of uh, uh, dictionary pages. Um, and of course, then creating this. One of the things about the oil paints is that I can put in all these shadows and just really have fun. Next image. I did uh, three of these big horses. They're quite large. And what I did was I took the paint peels. Some of them were pretty big. And I began to lay them down and do these horses' bodies, which were perfect vehicles for the for the horses' bodies. And again, I have this huge dialogue with horses, photographs of horses, and my relationship with horses. And so it was really fun to do the three. There, this was the sort of my favorite one. It was called horse resting. Next image. At the same time, I um, I was again kind of messing around. This, these are now all 2021. Um, so uh, with this image, I did something a little bit different, uh, but ended up again with this kind of feeling of the, of the mother. This is called Coyote Mother. And um, this is, um, these are coyote heads that I have, or coyotes that I have photographs of. And this is all plant material that I put together to, to, again, I think it's what Suzanne was talking about. It's being part of nature. It's saying, this is what matters to me. This is what I see. This is what I think about. Um, and then forming the image, uh, next image. So again, very new, this is called Forest Mother. Um, that, that saying, those coyotes keep popping in. We have co coyotes that live in the field behind us and, and I am always rushing to get my camera to photograph them. But I'm also a little bit always terrified that they're going to jump over the fence and eat my small dogs. So there's this sort of love-hate relationship. Um, the, the trees with the birds I've always loved, paint peels, the rabbit in her arms. It's sort of that reference of, uh, that's, I want to be that part of that. I want to be part of that world where the mother is just the, the end all. Next. So these are the last two I have, and they're, they're very recent, 2021. Um, and what I had were a number of um, uh, washes that I'd done in 2014, so six years ago. And they were so beautiful that I couldn't figure out what to do with them. And I finally got them out and started working and working and working and working. And I would put things down and they kind of work, but eh, they weren't so great. And I would take them off and lay down some more images. And finally, 
I had this one face that I cut up and just by simply using the features, it, it ended up being just perfect. And I ended up doing five more of these and I brought two in to show you. So this is the first one. It's called um, just uh, single face, next one. And then this one is called double face, but you can see the wash and then trying to incorporate the wash as well as uh, and making it be something without it being too much something. So it's just this incredible balance that you have. And, and they seem so simple, but they took me weeks to get there. Again, pulling up the, what was down and putting down new ones. And they're all eyes and noses and mouths of people I know and mostly really like. Um, I, don't, I have a hard time using an image when I don't like the person or the thing. So these are all people I'm familiar with that those eyes are talking about them. And then of course, these beautiful washes that form the faces. So that's the last one. So thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. That was wonderful. It's so exciting to see new work from both of you. Well, thank you. Yeah. So Holly, you mentioned a little bit about how COVID has impacted your practice. I wonder, Suzanne, if you'd be willing to share how COVID has impacted your artistic practice. Well, I, uh, I really enjoyed Holly's talk. Thanks, Holly. Um, but in terms of COVID, it hasn't changed my practice that much. I mean, I do feel a little freed up that there's not as many distractions. So I'm getting into the studio more, studio more regularly, but right at the beginning of COVID, I moved and then renovated this garage into a studio and all of that took a bunch of time. So there was a part of COVID where I didn't really get to work at all. And now I, I'm just kind of uh, blissed out in the studio space, but it does feel like an incredible refuge from the world. And like, there's total freedom in there. Whereas out in the world, you know, we're so limited. We're just butting up against all these limitations. And, um, and in my studio, I just, I have a great time in there. I, it's, and it's a great refuge. Thank you. We have a question from our dear Roger Atkins, um, who wants to know, how does living in New Mexico inform your work? Who's that directed to? Is that for both of you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's just so, you, you are what you are, you know? So the colors we see, the space, the animals, the, the for me, I mean, those are, those are all the things that are in my life. And I know when I lived in Virginia, um, one spring semester, I, I was doing all these trees because I just couldn't believe there were trees and green things everywhere. So you're always affected by what's around you. And I think New Mexico's, I, I think it would actually be good for me to get out of New Mexico because I'm so familiar with it and it's wonderful, but you know, you need to be shaken up a little bit. For me, I've been in New Mexico for um, 31 and a half years now. And I really found my voice here. And I think a lot of it was about the horizon and just um, that feeling of the ground and the sky meeting and my feet being on the ground and having this vast sky just really sparked my imagination and made me feel more free than I'd ever felt when I lived on the East Coast growing up or other places I've traveled to. Um, that openness of the sky it just kind of gives me creative freedom to imagine. Yeah, and Suzanne, you also have a background in psychology, right? So do you see that kind of informing your inspiration and the way that you make your work? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I moved here originally to go to graduate school at UNM and it was a program in art therapy in the art education department. And it was a, post Jungian archetypal approach to art therapy. So I really focused in, it was a lot of focus on dreams and mythology and um, really looking at like Carl Jung and the writings of James, Hill, James Hillman in terms of how like symbols and, and myths um, connect us all through the collective unconscious. So, um, that definitely informs my work a lot. And I got started on that path actually in high school with my high school philosophy teacher, Dominic Fela, who taught a class called Myth, Dream, and Ritual. 
And that just stuck with me from when I was like 16, that, that sense of um, symbols and, and connectivity, connecting, connectiveness, connectedness through symbols um, and, and accessing dreams uh, and the unconscious through images. That's um, for me, that's sort of that psychology background plays out in my work in that way. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Katie Foreman for you, Suzanne. Um, do you see an image first and create your work and off of the idea that you got from that image or do you begin with the idea and then find an image that works for that? Actually, neither. I begin with, a, with an openness and I try not to have a plan because a plan is just limiting. So I try to let the images guide me and I'm definitely, um, you know, experimenting and playing a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I don't ha have a pre, uh, it's not conceptual work. So I don't have a concept and then execute it. It's really process oriented and, um, and it comes out of really letting go of the conscious mind and, and, and seeing where my unconscious takes me. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Holly, we have a question from our fearless leader and director of the Turchin Center, Denise Ringler. Um, and she says it, it was so interesting to hear your insights on women flying, um, which invites us to think about the idea that perhaps we need to fall or fail um, before we can succeed. And she also says thanks to both of you, Suzanne and Holly, for transforming Turchin's main gallery and sharing this magical work with us, which I think all of us here at the Turchin Center would echo. Well, it, it, to me, it was interesting because I didn't know if she was committing suicide <laughs> or taking off. You know, it was like, and then, and then you know, it turned out she was flying. She's going to fly. So I don't know if that's exactly what Denise was thinking of, but I was pleased that it was one or the other, you know, that she, she ended up being a positive uh, note instead of the other one. Yeah, I think, Holly, you've inspired me in that way a lot, too, where I often am riding that edge of, is this good or is this bad in terms of what's going on, what the narrative is? And uh, um you know, the, the viewer takes it in their own direction. But I think I've always pushed you to take it bad. <laughs> you yeah, <know? laughs> you've always pushed me to jump off a cliff, which is a really exactly. good thing. It's a really exactly. good thing to jump off a cliff when you're trying to make art and, right. and let go. Yep. That is really amazing. Uh, I want to read a little bit of Mary Ann's exhibition statement about your work. Um, she says that both of you share a similar sensibility. Uh, they both use collage, weaving textures and images which are incorporated into surrealistically enigmatic artworks that open subconscious doorways into the ambiguous space of the night, haunting dreams brim with narrative probability remaining stubbornly resistant to literal interpretation. There are libraries of potential in a single image and the lyricism of worlds breaking apart to be restructured into new impossible possibilities. Um, the lost physicality of photograph, paint and paper in our smooth digi digital age, uh, memories of a time when humans and animals were more closely connected. And she goes on to say, the power of dreams is that they open the heart and the mind to endless possibilities. Um, in these images, the dreams of the artists emerge from the shadows to inhabit shared spaces where we are called to a deep interpretation of what we see and what remains unspoken. Um, and I would love to know how that resonates with both of you and how you kind of envision your work speaking to one another. God, that's so beautiful what Marianne wrote. It's like, oh my God. I know, and <laughs> she, she just says it so words well. with, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she is amazing. <laughs> Try to bring yeah, tears she, to your eyes, you know. She puts words to things that are very hard to articulate. So thank you, Marianne, for doing that. But yeah, I, I find it's it's this place of mystery that I'm always looking for. And 
it's not popular really in the art world that it's not a, you know, it's not a critical, it's not a critique. Uh, you can't really critique dreams in a way, you know, it's, um, it's, it's something very different. My, the work I do as a curator in, in the art world is very, very mental and, um, and uh, then, the, then the art making process is um, still very much focused on organization of elements, but it's controlled by this um, mysterious inner place. <laughs> I always tell my students that it's what you don't know that's much more interesting than what you know. You know, exactly. That, that's the hook for us. Whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you were to say this image means this, it would be totally boring and it would shut down and be of no interest. And it's that that inexplicable, you know, quality of wondering that makes you want to keep looking. And I think it's that that walk between the dark and the light too, that is, you know, it's not one or the other. It's not happy town. It's not suicideville. It's this in-between area that's gray and murky and fascinating. You know, I think that, that we're, we're both always headed in that direction. Both of your work is really so beautiful and poetic. And, um, you know, as Marianne kind of says, melds your reality with the dream world to create something that is really quite interesting and unique. And I wonder how that narrative that you're creating um, has changed over time and really what you hope the viewers will take away from experiencing your work. Well, I feel like my work has gone from being really, really, really personal, um, sometimes almost painfully personal to now being um, I don't have the same issues now. I've, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years and I feel like I've worked through all these issues. I'm a, I'm a kind of a mature person now. And so there's a, what? There's a different story. Stop it, Suzanne, <laughs> just back off. <laughs> kind of. Anyways, it's about, it's about a bigger worldview, I think, than my earlier work. And, and it's interesting with Suzanne doing the psychology stuff because I feel like we both have that leaning, you know, that psychological fix on things but mine has gotten as i said less personal and more big picture so that's how i feel like i've changed suzanne wow well it's hard to reflect back on one's own work like that i i, I wish marianne would answer this question for me or, <laughs> or, or you or somebody else but yeah. um i uh i've definitely gotten more confident in my what comes naturally to me when I in earlier in my art evolution ev evolution as an artist I would worry a lot that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to and I was supposed to be um, an abstract painter or I was supposed to be pushing a limit of um, some style of art making that didn't actually come naturally to me. So I was really had a lot more struggle with it. And at a certain point, um, I accepted what came naturally and, and decided to just run with that and, and enjoy it and, and have fun with it. And at this point, you know, I have this day job that's super, super intense and I'm not looking in my art practice to be tormented you know, that I still, you know, am, of course, because that, that also comes naturally, but I have a lot of fun doing it. And I accept that I have an, I have a um, certain knacks or skills or intuitive uh, capacity that are gifts that I enjoy. So I've kind of given into that. And um, I have less external voices telling me in the studio what I should be doing. Although they're still there, but there are fewer of them, I think. And, and I, have, I trust myself more than I used to. That's wonderful. Thank you so, both so much. Um, we have a question from April Flanders, who is a printmaking professor here at App State. And she wants to know from both of you, what is your creative, both physical and concept conceptual process? And how does play or a sense of creative play inform that process? Well, I don't think I have anything conceptual in anywhere in my bones. It's just like 
huh, what's that? Um, and I and I feel like I suffer a lot when I make my art, but I've done it so long, it's not even really suffering the way it used to be. And the play, I think, just comes when I paint. You know, it's just so uh, you're throwing paint around, you're dripping it, you're splatting it, you're you're just doing whatever you can think of, um, and that's that's the playful part. That's but even then, that's it's like, does this work or not? No, I don't know. Let me add some more. Oh, you ruined it. You know. So that's always this edge of. Uh, of having fun with air quotes there, cause that's not really right. And screwing everything up, you know, just ruining it completely. So I hope that answers your question, April, for me. Yeah, it's definitely riding that edge of fun and horror. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, you have to repeat the question for me. Conceptual, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Um, well, sure. the, it was actually, you were asking about process. Yeah. Yeah, I can about read it again. Uh, she's okay. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, she says, what is your creative, both physical and conceptual process? And how does play or a sense of creative play inform that process? Um, yeah, I would say that in the process, there are certain things I do that in that I do a certain way that are, um, you know, I cut up, I, cut, I have a lot of pieces of things cut up, paper, and I'm very attached to that tactile quality. I'm not interested in Photoshop for, for this kind of work. Um, so it's very much about my hands and the scissors and the glue and peeling the glue off of my fingers and getting paint all over and, um, the process involves um, not only the collage part, but also the painting. So I like prepare a surface and then I paint with acrylics in really bright, ugly, glaring colors just to have a base to start on. And I try to work with warm colors usually on, uh, as the underpainting because it really gives it kind of a luminosity. And then I'll, I'll plan a collage, I'll compose a collage separately, but then after I've done the acrylic paint, I, I glue the collage down and seal it with gel medium. And then I paint with oils on top of that. And that's where the biggest magic happens is when the oils kind of make this composition into a real place, you know, it creates the environment and it, and it brings it all together. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with Holly on not being conceptual in my day job, I'm very conceptual and very mental. And in my studio, I'm really trying to just have a sense of play and um, and wonderment. Yeah, I think for both Suzanne and I, our fingers do the walking. You know that yeah. our hands do make the decisions, call the shots. We just have to get our heads out of there and let the other stuff take over. I think for both of us, right, Suzanne? For sure. And I really like to be surprised. I mean, that's what I look for is trying to surprise myself or having these images from God knows where they come from in the world. Um, just being, being surprised by the images that show up. And, uh, and a lot of times they make me laugh and I feel like that's a good thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Christy is curious about the scale of your work. Um, she says that we've seen small works and very large works in the gallery and wants to know if you can talk about how you work differently in large versus small scale. Well, well I, I really love, go ahead, Susan. Okay, I really love working small and it works well for collage because things glue flatter when they're small and it can be more immediate because then I don't have to go and try to enlarge things to make them work larger. But um, there's limitations to working small. So it, I mostly work small to medium, but occasionally I work large. And in galleries always want me to work larger because they can get more money for larger pieces. I mean, the prices are based on the square inch in the, in the sales market, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's more challenging to work big. And it's something that I, I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out if I can make a small collage and turn it into a much larger painting. 
Um, so that that's one of the challenges I wrestle with. And I, for right now, where I am in my life, I feel like I'm just I only want to work big. Of course, I just did these these six nine by twelve ones, <laughs> you know. But but still, I just got a bunch of panels from David Lerner, and um, and I'm getting ready to to just do these big ones. There's something in me that says, "No more little stuff, Holly. Come on, let's get going." So we'll see what happens. I think so much of it is breaking our own rules. Like there's breaking the rules that we were taught in art school or whatever by teachers, but there's also breaking our own rules when we set out to say, okay, I'm going to make only large pieces. Of course, you're going to want to, um, you know, rebel against yourself and then make a bunch of small ones. And part of the, part of, for, for me, a lot of art making is um, breaking the rules, including my own rules that I, my, I, I set for myself that the rules are to be broken. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is exactly right. I love that. Um, I have a question that's kind of directed towards Holly. Uh, your earlier work, you mentioned, began with the photograph, whereas your newer work kind of begins with the painting. Um, and I really loved when you said that you use photography not for what it is, but for what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we have a lot of photographers here tonight. Um, but I wondered if you could talk about that shift in your relationship to photography or even, you know, printmaking through your work. Well, I, I started out as a printmaker. So I have this kind of inherent vocabulary about layering of paint or, you know, first it was ink and then it was paint. But I, I've always kind of danced around with photography. And it's, I have, I think, I, I don't know, I have something like 100,000 files on my computer. But when you tell that to a photographer, they go, oh, yeah, big deal. <laughs> but to me, you know, that's a lot. But um, it's just, it, it's there. I, I love it. It does this magical thing, just like David Featherstone said, you know, it's just the tiniest bit of the photo suddenly makes this different reality. And I think my problem now, again, being the age I am, is I've photographed everything. I've done it. I've been there, done that. And now finding stuff that I'm still interested in to photograph is really the tricky thing. I'm not adding that many photos to my, um, to my files. And, uh, and that's a little distressing. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I actually was remembering that I had a big breakthrough moment at a workshop that Holly was teaching at Penland where I was your assistant there and um, before that, I had really focused in on the t technique Holly had taught me of oil painting on photographs. So I was printing, whether they were um, 35 millimeter or um, pinhole photographs with large negatives, I was printing all different sizes up to like 20 by 24 and painting with oils on them. Um, but then at that workshop, I, I used this large roll of paper and ended up doing a collage in a very big space and working with the paint in a really different way. And that was a pivotal moment for um, working with both collage and paint. And it actually took me away from my own photography because I started working more and more with found materials. Um, but yeah, interesting parallel journeys we've had. Exactly, yeah intersecting lines. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we have another question from April and she wants to know, Suzanne, where do you source your collage materials? Um, no one particular place. I gather stuff from old books and um, old magazines. I get stuff from antique shops, old photos. Uh, people give me a lot of old photos. A lot of the um, historic cabinet portraits, cabinet portraits of people from their generations back and their families, people. A lot of those end up in thrift stores and, and antique shops. And then a lot of people don't know what to do with them. So they give them to me so that they have another life. Um, but I, I tend to copy off, like on a copier, a lot of images. I use color copies and black and white copies so that I can keep using certain images over and over again. But um, basically, you know, it's all, I, it's mostly stuff I've stolen, <laughs> whether it's from art history or from books. Um, 
some of it's original, some of it's copied. It's whatever is is available to me. So I, I'm I'm constantly gathering and cutting things up, and then when I'm composing, I'm using what's what's there, what what I've gathered, what spoke to me. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Greg Banks, who's a photography professor at App. And he wants to know, Holly, if there's a relationship between your faces and African masks, and if you've ever considered making masks. Well, I actually did. Uh, I, I would take plaster and cast faces and paint them, and they're just terrible. Um, <laughs> but I've always loved masks. We have a collection of Mexican masks, and then, of course, all those wonderful Alaskan masks, the Northwest Coast masks. A good mask is hard to beat. So while I I, my masks were always a flop. I feel like I have used, incorporated that, the, the, the idea of masks and what masks do in, into my work. So absolutely, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, Holly, I wanted to ask you too, you know, in a lot of your work, you have lots of these universal iconographies or these symbols that are kind of evocative of certain archetypes, you know, like for example, the coyote or the, um, crow as trickster um, and I was wondering if you can expand on how you know or if you see those themes embedded in your more figurative work with the human-like forms. Well I think it's instead of thinking of them as iconographic symbols they're in my world you know crows are there flying around in the field and not letting me photograph them because they're so sensitive to if you raise your arm. Coyotes as I mentioned I just am always trying to to get photographs of them. A lot of times I'll take photographs of dead coyotes, you know, roadkill. Um, so, and, and, and I think I have to I watch out for things like what the coyote, I mean, the coyote is such a cliche and, and that's something you kind of have to dance around, especially living in the Southwest, you know, the coyote howling at the moon. Um, and then birds, again, that's another cliche that I think we have to, Suzanne and I have to work hard to not make it be a cliche. So yeah, like the thinking, whole put a bird on it phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put a bird on it. And I think that you sort of, um, you want it to be personal. I want it to be personal. I want it to be in my life. That's that coyote that almost ain't my little dog. That's that dead coyote by the road that I photographed. That's whatever. And so I think that that's where it's coming from more than a bigger, more profound symbolic thing. But then hopefully they are that, you know, hopefully they do cross over into that other side but without me directing them to be that way. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think you both do that in a really delicate way. Um, that is- Oh, thank you. Successful. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. Um, if anybody else has some questions to throw up in the chat, we're, looks like we're running towards the end of our time here, but Holly or Suzanne, do you have anything else you wanna share that maybe we didn't touch on? For me, it's been really fun having Suzanne to dialogue with, you know, because I know her so well. I've watched her develop. I, I have, and you know, affected her art. And then she's also taken these paths that are similar to mine, but different. And so just to kind of um, check in with her, be able to have this dialogue that we wouldn't have normally, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do this if we were just sitting over coffee. So that's been really fun, you know, to, here we are, we're living in Albuquerque, but we're talking <laughs> from North Carolina, you know, it, it's just really kind of great. Totally, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne and Holly, for so graciously sharing your time and your work and your insights with us this evening. And thank you to everyone else who here, who's here joining us and you know, for sharing space in this digital realm. Um, it's really nice to celebrate such inspiring artists and really connect around their work and continue to cultivate community in new ways. Um, I just wanna say to be sure and check out our upcoming art talks that are on the Turchin Center's website. Um, Christy's gonna drop the link to that webpage in the chat for you. Um, and thank you again, everyone and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you, Thank you guys, so it's much. been great. Thank you.